Uh, okay, so this talk is going to be very different from the ones that you have seen so far, um, because what I'm going to try to convince you about, and probably already convinced, I don't know, uh, is that um, the pilot wave theory is actually making progress, not only in experimental uh, situation, in understanding experimental situation, but also uh, understanding what the world is like. Okay, so the title of my talk is What If? And I'm going to speculate about uh, what would be the best of all possible quantum worlds. Um, okay, so assuming that I can go. Yes. Okay. Um, so quantum theory has always had, I mean, it's been praised by, because for having an outstanding predictive power, both in depth and in breadth. However, uh, the main problem is that it seems to have no explanatory power whatsoever. Uh, indeed, uh, scientific realists who believe that uh, scientific theories are telling us something about the world, right? What the world is made of, uh, believe uh, that the theory is incompatible with their view. Okay, that's because mostly uh, it's unable to provide a microscopic story like classical mechanics, the world made of particles, what is the world made of if quantum mechanics is true. Um, however, uh, what happens is that um, realists think that um, you can make um, the theory compatible uh, with realism, providing a solution of the so-called measurement problem. So the idea is that if you can solve the measurement problem, then you can talk about uh, quantum theory as providing us a picture of reality. The measurement problem is basically the problem of macroscopic superposition, which has which are unobserved, like uh, a you know a dead cat and a live cat. And the solutions that have been proposed go from the von Neumann collapse rule, saying that when there is a measurement, uh, the wave function doesn't does does no longer evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, but collapses one of the terms of the superposition. Uh, more precise, we have the spontaneous collapse theory in which the evolution is nonlinear and stochastic. And then uh, you have um, the, the Broly bohm pilot wave theory in which the complete description is given by the wave function and by the particles configuration. And you also have many words, but in that case, um, um, you embrace uh, the macroscopic superposition. Uh, my problem, I mean, my, my claim, what I want to kind of uh, convince people these days is that the measurement problem is the wrong problem to look at if you are a realist, okay? And I'm going to do that uh, looking at history uh, in the sense that uh, there, is, there are no compelling rational reasons to have ever considered it. And people have tried to provide, uh, had people tried to provide the reductive understanding they used uh, so far in science before quantum theory to explain the quantum rules, all the pieces would have fit together in a simple and straightforward schema. Namely, particles move uh, according to highly non-classical trajectories and interact and interact non-locally. Uh, there would be if you if uh, so the, what that's what I'm gonna try to show that uh, if you ignore, I mean, uh, if people had been had people been uh, looking at the right things. Uh, there will be no mention of instrumentalism, no mention of measurements, observer being fundamental, no, no mention of the measurement problem of consciousness of wave function being the ontology of the theory, no mention of many words, no mention actually also of non -stoch stochastic nonlinear modification of the Schrodinger equation, no mention of contextuality. Okay, so whatever you find of a quantum weirdness, you would not have found. Okay, so in order to convince you of this, let's let's just like go back to the basics of classical physics that we all are familiar with. So what is matter? There was matter and there was light. Matter was made of microscopic massive three-dimensional point particles that evolve according to given trajectories. And then we had, um, because of electromagnetic phenomena, we had to add certain properties to um, the particles, not only the mass, but also the charge. And then we had on the other side, the light, uh, which was made of waves oscillating in three-dimensional space and uh, was identified as, it this uh, was identi 
light was identified as wave after long controversies uh, because of the interference and diffraction phenomena that we know of. So what is very distinctive about classical physics is the type of explanation that it provides. It's a reductive dynamical schema, meaning what? Meaning that macroscopic properties that we observe, like, I don't know, the transparency of the window, the solidity of the cable, are explained in terms of the motion of the, mi the microscopic particles that compose them, right? Uh, and the prototypical, the prototypical example of this type of explanation is given by statistical mechanics. Um, a la Boltzmann, that's what I mean. Uh, classical physics is a constructive theory, if you're familiar with Einstein's uh, terminology, but what it means uh, is actually basically the idea of having kind, kind of dynamical reduction uh, in which if, if really, if you have this, this uh, dynamics of the microscopic particles, this is enough to understand the, um, the macroscopic phenomena. This is opposed to principal theories like um, thermodynamics, for example, in which you say those principles occur because um, of, of, of such, uh, such, sorry, those phenomena occur because of such and such a principle, right? Energy is conserved, right? And entropy increases, that's it. Uh, if you have a phenomena that if, according to which entropy decreases, the total entropy, uh, then the phenomena cannot happen. That's opposed to um, um, constructive theories. Okay, so as you can see, this trajectory, uh, you can interpret that in many ways. One is the quantum trajectory of the particle according to the pilot wave theory. And the other one, um, more metaphorically, you can see that as the actual historical trajectory of quantum uh, to reach quantum theory from classical physics, right? So we had classical physics, a, um, a well-defined theory that was able to account given uh, many, many, many phenomena until to a point uh, in which it couldn't. Uh, and then we got, at some point, we got this new theory, this quantum physics, and the way in which we went from one to the other was very, very bumpy, convoluted, and full of accident of many sorts. Um, we are told as students in physics that uh, quantum theory forces us to abandon this idea of explanation that we just saw in classical theory. Our language is hopelessly incomplete. We will never be able to understand what lies beyond the phenomena. The classic and the quantum world are complementary. Either you see one, you see the other. If you understand one, you understand the other. Experiments change or even create the reality beyond the phenomena, right? These are all things that I've been told. So I imagine maybe stuff has changed and I hope so. But I mean, that's what uh, uh, people of my generation have been told in physics departments. There is a paradigm shift Mm -hmm. um, however, and there are many books, historical books, for example, Marabella's book, uh, but also others um, that, that show um, that uh, most of what, what we are told is just propaganda, right? What is being called Bohr's rhetoric on inevitability, right? He wanted to convince everybody that his understanding was inevitable, but that wasn't true. So uh, what about this arrow? This arrow, it can be seen as a, tra as a classical trajectory of the particle. And, but also again, metaphorically speaking, it can be seen as um, the what if historical trajectory of quantum theory, meaning what? The history of what would have likely happened if certain misunderstandings, certain propaganda, certain political opposition, blah, 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 did not happen. Right, uh, had only rational arguments be listened to, this would be would have been the trajectory. What what would it, what would this trajectory be? Okay, let me try and uh, be. I mean, indulge me in this kind of um, his story. Uh, so let's try and, and tell a story about what it could have been in the best of all possible quantum words. Meaning, what is what would have been uh, the story? Okay, so all these things are true. All these things really happened, okay? Uh, around the 1900, uh, uh, there were some uncooperating experiments like the black body radiation, atomic spectrum, the stability of the atom and blah, 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 that suggested quantization. And the project by Bohr and Sommerfeld was to determine the right quantization rule for the various quantities within the classical under uh, understanding, right? Of 
matter being made of particle and light being understood as, as a way, right? Uh, what this project, the bohr sommer project of providing the quantization rule was a principal type of explanation. Oops. Uh, in the sense that these are the quantization rules, this is what's gonna happen and I mean, but what not gonna happen. There was no attempt to providing a dynamical reductive explanation of, of why this, this um, quantization rule were the case, right? Not at the time. And then we had um, the, the, the Compton and photoelectric effect that showed somehow how particles, um, 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 sorry, there was a particle aspect of light um, and then, um, and Einstein in 1905 understood, I mean, uh, provided an explanation of this, uh, introducing the photon, as we, we all know. Then we had particle interference, in which on the other side we had wave aspects that show a wave aspect of particles. The Brolin 1923 uh, provided suggesting that to every particle there is a wave. And, uh, sorry, yes, uh, there was a wave particle association. Light has been has a particle associated with it, the photon, and matter is a wave associated with it, with it too, right? So building up on Einstein. However, he was not able to provide an equation for the matter waves, as we all know. In 1926, Schrodinger's wave mechanics uh, was proposed to reductively explain the quantization rule. So it was a, a, um, a, a step further in the understanding, right, of why we have these principles that are governing the phenomena, uh, they are, you know, regulating the phenomena. The fundamental object for Schrodinger, what in philosophy is called the ontology, is was a wave uh, that mathematically was represented by the wave function, which has a, um, a deterministic evolution, uh, this in his famous uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, he was he provided um, successful examples of reduction um, in which he provided explanation of the hydrogen spectrum. Um, uh, the lines are actually the nodes of the wave function um, and um, particles. There are no fundamental particles. What particles are, are localized wave packets. However, uh, uh, the Broly wasn't um, well received. Lauren, um, um, uh, Schrodinger was not very, very well received uh, because the packet is actually spreading. So there was no, there is no stable particle trajectories. And for two or more particles, very importantly, the wave function is an object in high dimensional configuration space. And people like uh, the Broly, Lorenz, and Einstein, so, uh, most. Uh, Importantly, uh, they thought about that to be very unphysical. This is not like a, uh, a an electromagnetic field which is oscillating in three-dimensional space. This is a, this is kind of an. They thought it was a, um, a, a, a an abstract object. It could not be understood as a real field, right? So, and because the reductive schema needs uh, three-dimensional things. Um, and here are some quotes that I'm going to skip for saving time. Uh, Schrodinger did acknowledge it was a problem, uh, and his proposal was to say, okay, forget about the wave function in configuration space. Let's take the square module uh, of that and call and, and, and identify with a charge density uh, in three dimensional space. However, again, we have wave spreading, even if later on was taking care of uh, recognizing the role of the environment and unobserved microscopic uh, charge density superposition uh, are still present, right? So the, uh, the theory is not empirically adequate, right? Because it's a wave with the wave superimposed and so superimposed mi microscopically and macroscopically. So he thought there was no hope for this ontology. In 1952, when we have a big jump in our what if theory, Bohm uh, used the result of the Broglie and Schrodinger to construct a new theory, the De Broglie Bohm theory, in which the fundamental object is no longer part and no longer ways, but is particles, the evolution is the deterministic, uh, is a deterministic evolution guided uh, by the wave function itself evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. Uh, the meaning of the wave function um, is not as representing matter according to Bohm, 
um, but um, um, it's similar to the Hamiltonian. This avoids uh, the problems of wave mechanics because particles do not spread, obviously, and uh, superposition of the wave function have no physical meaning because exactly the wave function is not uh, representing matter. Uh, and so this was a theory uh, in our what if theory. You have this theory makes empirical predictions, including that there are certain trajectories. Um, and in 2011, the first experimental confirmation of the trajectory was observed. So this is the predicted, and this is the observed. Okay. Uh, so what are the consequences of this theory? Um, the Schrodinger evolving wave function uh, is the wave function of the universe. In, in general, instead, systems do not have a wave function, uh, which is Schrodinger evolving. In, only in certain suitable situations they do. And that's where we talk about effective wave function of a system, which may evolve into superposition. But in, again, in certain experimental situations, the wave function uh, effectively collapses, namely it stops evolving according to the Schrodinger's equation. The particle's motion is governed by this for all practical purposes. In terms of the superposition uh, in which the wave function will collapse uh, is determined. So the idea is that um, there is effective collapse, right? So the von Neumann rule uh, works effectively. Uh, we cannot predict which in, in advance, right? We cannot predict which uh, in which term of the superposition the wave function will collapse because that depends on the initial position of the particles and we do not have access to them. So one of the consequences of this theory is that we have effective collapse. Another consequence of this theory is that uh, the uncertainty principle, what we can know is connected uh, whether, uh, to whether we can correlate systems with one another. When we have equilibrium, each system is independent, that is, you cannot form correlation, and so you cannot, you cannot have any knowledge, right? Since nothing changes. Uh, so the wave function is not in equilibrium, but the configuration of the particles are in the so-called quantum equilibrium. So all we can know about the system is given by the system wave function. And this is uh, Eisenberg 1927 in the determinacy or uncertainty in principle that says that there are limitations uh, to what we can know about the system. Another consequence is the Born rule. Experimental results are statistical because we don't know where the particles were and where they are. Um, there is this notion which is equivariance that says that assuming a given initial universal wave function, if the particles are initially randomly arranged according to a distribution given by the square model of the initial universal wave function C squared uh, times zero, then they will continue to, distribute it, to be distributed like that. And from this, it follows the Born rule that the probability of finding a particle in, in X is given by the square model of the wave function. In statistical mechanics, the systems likely evolves towards a greater entropy. So you can just say, uh, by analogy that in the pilot wave theory of the Broly and Bohm, the system likely evolves toward the greater value of this upside squared. And then another consequence, you have matrix mechanics. Um, Bell um, um, pointed out that all measurements are position measurements, nonetheless operators effectively summarizes experimental results as pointed out uh, by Bohr, the Heisenberg, Bohr and Jordan in 1926. So that's the meaning of their matrix mechanics. So each experiment one can associate in it in operator, and the possible experimental results are given by the eigenvalues. And one can write, one can write the, the wave functions in a combination of the eigenstate, and from that it follows the general um, the probability uh, the general uh, ge generalized more rule. Uh, so here's another consequence. Um, for Neumann in 1932 provided an impossibility proof. But in this new context, this no-go theorem is actually can be easily seen as a no-go theorem against genuine measurement, that most experiments are not genuine measurement. When we talk about genuine measurement uh, when experiments, when there is an experiment in which the system is not too much disturbed. Okay, instead you can have a destructive experiment in which the system is very much perturbed. 
this type of experiments measure nothing. Obviously, you destroy the system. This happened because experiments are physical processes, right? For example, to determine the velocity of an unmoving particle inside of a box, we need to remove the box and then the particle will start moving, okay? These proofs are also known as contextuality proofs. Whether an experiment is destructive or not depends on the context. And so whether an experiment or not provides a measurement of something existing prior to the experiment depends on the context. Destructive experiments are associated with non-commuting operators, right? Because since they are destructive, the order in which you perform the experiment is important, right? You read the message and then you burn it. It's different from you burn it and then you read it. Another one and the most important consequence, according to me, is that um, given that the wave function is on configuration space, even if it doesn't represent anything physical, I mean material, um, it shows that by it, one, the consequence is that by acting on a particle here, one affects the particle over there instantaneously, and this is what is called the non locality. And this is the problem with that, it, that seems to be in contrast with relativity. The situation is very complicated and it's very unclear exactly what that means, but for sure in 1964, Bell worked out a local reductive understanding of quantum phenomena with a generic in the variable ontology and its empirical prediction different from the one, uh, from the ones of the, the pilot wave theory. So it provided a crucial test. Remember I said that the Broly Bone theory because in this what if uh, um, story, there is no other theory, okay? In 1982, the, this crucial test falsified, so falsified the local theory and confirmed the De Broglie Bohm theory. So the open question, which is the one that we should be focusing about, is exactly what does this mean for relativity and how these two theories are, um, they can, how they can be combined. So this is where we are right now, or better, this is where we would be had things gone very differently than actually they did. Okay, so, so far we have seen no measurement observer being fundamental, no instrumentalism, no complementarity, no unobserved macroscopic superpositions, no high dimensional field ontology, no stochastic modification of the Schrodinger equation, no und undetectable infinity uh, of non-interacting world, no consciousness, none of the quantum weirdness has come up. So everything got shut down when people focus on keeping the reductive schema, right? So when since people wanted to keep that, none of the quantum weirdness showed up. So why would they actually, I mean, if you think about that, right? If, why would you give up on that, right? If you don't even try. So they tried and they succeeded, right? The Broly Bomb theory. Uh, and in this way, we have a clear and simple picture of the world according to which particles move around in three dimensions, following highly non-classical laws, as we saw the pictures, and in which the main discovery of modern science on locality is explicit. Uh, hold on one sec. Um, and the theory was empirically confirmed. So, but this is not what actually has happened. What actually has happened is not as linear or as rational as the one just presented. It's full of misunderstanding, people talking past each other, you know, ignoring arguments, silencing unwanted objection, politics, propaganda. So um, uh, how much do I have left? Uh, well, I was so deep, uh, deeply in, in the talk that I, I didn't know. <laughs> You lost track. Okay, so I can keep <laughs> I going. lost time. All right. <laughs> I think right. I, you must. So I think uh, I have. I still have 20 minutes or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, good. Um, okay, hold on. Um, so this is what actually happened in nine, I mean, very quickly, not to be too boring. In 1900, quantum rules. Uh, in 1925, Heisenberg, Bohr, and Jordan developed matrix mechanic that provided a unified model to systematize the experimental results, right? Not to understand them, but just to systematize. No dynamics, no space, and no objects. Right. Initially, because of the positivistic influences, there were they wanted to have no unobservable objects. Right. So they wanted to completely give up the reductive schema. Mm -hmm. In 1926, Schrödinger says, "Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. Right. We can provide 
a reductive schema by going to waves, right? So he wanted explicitly to provide a reductive explanation of the quantum rules in terms of vibration, which was equivalent to matrix mechanics, but also visualizable. That's what he found very, very important. Eisenberg discovered the uncertainty relation around the same time, um, and but he wanted to, I mean, so somehow he caved a little bit. And so he said, okay, right? Uh, maybe there are positions, right? But I mean, in what sense, right? That you cannot know simultaneous position and momentum, so there are no trajectories. So there was a jump, right? From epistemology to metaphysics. Unwarranted, obviously. In initial, we had some kind of an internal disagreement with the Copenhagen School uh, because Bohr favored particles, in, and um, but then they somehow put everybody to uh, quiet, right? They had to fight the opponent. Okay, you can find all this um, in many interesting books, um, history of quantum mechanics. Uh, later, they formed a compact front in Schrodinger's wave mechanics uh, and accused Schrodinger of being of not being able to explain the quantum jumps. Even if he did, the broadest preliminary proposal for a complete quantum theory in terms of particle and waves was effectively shut down by uh, Pauli in 1927 at the Survey Conference. So many many things have happened. Um, however. Um, people started to use Schrodinger formally is nonetheless because it was, it was much easier to, to, to use uh, than the matrix mechanics. Okay, what happened? What did I do? Okay. Um, hold on, let me just move this. Too many windows here. Um, wave mechanics was also attacked. I mean, this is in the real history, right? Uh, by realists, right? we, we mentioned briefly uh, in the what if history, the Broly, Einstein and Lorenz were uh, very upset with Schrodinger because uh, the field that he proposed was in configuration space, highly dimensional space. Um, they, they wanted to argue that wave mechanics is incomplete um, because otherwise the, the reductive schema was false, right? Because they wanted three dimensional stuff, right? Um, so the wave function instead is, is in a physical field. And Schrodinger again, uh, as we have seen, said, okay, fine, you're right. What about a two-dimensional field ontology? And no, okay, superposition. So, okay, forget about that. Okay, so what happened next is that from 1927 to about 1935, um, many arguments were proposed um, um, that quantum mechanics, um, uh, as Eisenberg um, or Schrodinger proposed, was uh, false, was incomplete. Uh, one argument uh, comes from in 27 from Einstein that proposed a deterministic particle theory, which later uh, retracted because arguably it was non local. Uh, in 1927, during the survey conference, um, um, again, um, they, people proposed, I mean, Einstein proposed um, at the experiment that the particle, if you, if you observe a particle going through one slit, it diffracts, so it's everywhere. While if instead we observe it, we just see one spot, right? So what happens, right? I mean, is that, is, he wanted to argue that there was no locality there. This argument, however, was misunderstood completely by Bohr because he thought it was about the uncertainty principle. And uh, Eisenberg instead understood the argument, granted no locality, but denied that there was no con contradiction with relativity because he, he thought in terms of super, super, super luminous signals. I mean, this, this is another story, however. In 1930, again, in a survey, um, there was this other experiment that was proposed, a photon in energy, by Einstein, a photon in energy state superposition leaves a box and travels far away. By measuring the box weight, one creates the photon's energy. Again, this is an example of non-locality. Again, misunderstood by Bohr, who thought it was about uh, Einstein not understanding the, um, the time energy. Um, uncertainty principle. In 1935, in a letter to Schrodinger, Einstein um, proposed this, a wave function in a box is divided into halves. The boxes are sent in opposite direction. By opening one box, one affects the other. Again, you have 
and on locality. So these are all arguments to show that quantum mechanics has to be incomplete, otherwise locality is false. In 1935, again, we have the EPR argument, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, that we all know, a pair of entangled particles travel in opposite direction, result of the experiment on each side and on each particles are anti-correlated. This is no locality again. So the, Einstein took all this argument to show that we ha there have to be some sort of hidden variables, some sort of variables that still have to be recognized, representing, he thought, pre-existing properties revealed by the experiments. Again, this was misunderstood by Bohr. Then um, I, this was just an example of misunderstanding. Um, uh, there are actually more legitimate reasons uh, to discuss the project of completing quantum theory. Uh, one is the 1932 von Neumann's impossibility proof that we have seen that later followed by others. Um, von Neumann assumed that there are pre-existing properties whose values are revealed by experiments. And then he showed that these properties have to stand into mathematical contradictory relations. Therefore, he concluded that we cannot complete quantum theory as Einstein wanted. This proof was not sound, but it was only became clear only later. He has several um, problems. Uh, uh, in 1964, Bell showed that um, the existing property are actually not measured, and Grete Arman actually showed it uh, much earlier than that uh, without being recognized. Um, so these impossibility proofs gave effectively in the sense that nobody, I mean, uh, between 1932 and 1964, they didn't know Greta Herrmann. Um, people thought, okay, von Neumann did it, right? So we have to give up on that, okay? Uh, so this gave up, they, they, it gave the final blow to the proposal to complete quantum theory following the reductive schema and um, began, the logic of inevitability began. We cannot do better than what the Copenhagen School is offering us. The impossibility to force us to give up our dream of a reductive explanation and blah, blah. <clears throat> a final argument against quantum theory in the form of wave mechanics was provided in 1935 by the measurement problem, the cut paper, a radioactive nucleus decay is not, is in decayed non decay superposition is coupled with the vial of poison to be released in the box where there's a cat. Therefore, the cat is dead and is in a is in a dead and alive superposition. However, when we open the box, the cat is neither dead or alive. The theory is not empirically adequate. And a similar example uh, was coming from Einstein uh, before the paper. Uh, uh, the cut paper came um, came out in terms of a bomb exploded and not exploded. The system, in, so here's what he said. I'm just reading it quickly. The system is a, is a substance in chemically unstable equilibrium, perhaps a charge of gunpowder that, by means of, in, of intrinsic forces, can spontaneously combust. And when the average lifespan of the whole setup is a, is a year. In principle, they can quite easily be represented quantum mechanically. In the beginning, the psi function characterizes a reasonably well-defined macroscopic state, but according to your equation, meaning Schrodinger equation, after the course of a year, this is no longer the case at all. Rather, the psi function then describes a sort of blend of not yet and of already exploded systems. However, this argument did not work. Why not? Well, because we already had the von Neumann collapse of 1932 as a response to that, right? You know, only have the, when the measurement is performed, you know. Okay, so only in 1952, Bohm at Princeton rediscovered the Crowley expanding his work. He developed his theory as a microscopic understanding of quantum mechanics, not as a solution of the measurement problem. Just read it. He wrote, he wrote Newton's equation for motion and showed that one can reproduce the quantum prediction if you want a quantum potential. He no mention of the measurement problem. The wave function never collapses but there are no macroscopic superposition because matter is made of particles, right? However, Bohm was effectively ostracized by everyone and his sympathies towards communism got it exile in Brazil. With no pastor, he could not travel, he could not defend his theory and so on. Einstein, which he was initially supported, did not like the explicit non locality of the theory. So the theory was just dismissed. Um, um, 
assuming uh, because also there was an impossibility proof. Um, and um, people also thought the theory had an high cost um, because of the contextual properties. Properties whose value changes depending on how you measure them. Okay, even if in 1952, Bohm uh, showed that contextual properties do not exist, experimental results are not the pre existing values of some properties, right? They're the result of the interaction between the system and the environment. Uh, in 64, Bell showed the impossibility proof assumed, um, assumed non contextuality, namely that one can measure property without modifying the system, which is, however, unwarranted. You can complete quantum theory. The broly bone theory does this, but it was also non-local. So Bell started to wonder whether one could complete quantum theory while it was also preserving locality. And then we end up again with what we already saw. Bell started from the APR argument, concluded that the local theory would have to have pre-existing values, and then derived the inequality which, uh, which holds for this, his theory, but not for quantum mechanics. And then there were the experimental test and show that locality is false. Okay, this is what he argue, wanted to argue, but again, he was misunderstood. People thought that he proved that in the hidden variable as predicted by Einstein, local or not, are impossible. In 75, Barry formulated his inequality without passing from EPR, showing no locality. However, the controversy is still open about what did prove or did not prove. Okay, slowly the attention shifted again historically from the problem of keeping the reductive schema to solving the measurement problem. And then we had Everett uh, that started from the measurement problem in contrast with Bohm, right? And arguing against the von Neumann collapse because it was unsatisfactory. Um, and then in the 70s, um, there was the book on many words. Um, and then in the 80s, uh, Deutsch paper on quantum computers. Um, so this was the rise of the many words theory because not adding anything to the standard theory, not modifying the Schrodinger equation seems to many to be the best compromise as a solution of the measurement problem. Well, that is if you forget about the fact that it has an inflated metaphysics that all possible words are real. So because of the fact that it seemed to be uh, the simple best compromise, it grew in sympathies with the physicists. They didn't have to change anything. In the 70s, new conferences on foundation came about. In the 80s, um, they started a unifying dynamics project, like for example, the Girardi Rimini Weber theory. Um, a wave function evolves according to a stochastic nonlinear equation. It collapses in random times into places with the frequency which depends on how big the system is, so that we can actually have collapse. Okay, so hopefully I'm almost done. So, um, please, Pierre, go on. Yes, okay. So, Bell said that there are three ways of making realist sense of quantum theory. Either the wave function, as given by Schrodinger equation, is not everything or it is not right. This legitimized the many words theory and the dynamical collapse models. Um, they started to be considered equally plausible as the, the Broglie Bohm theory, each the, with pros and cons, right? Wave function realism, which is the, 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 the view that the wave function in configuration space is the ontology of the theory, what the tables and chairs are made of, became to, 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 to grow in, in, in consensus. Um, but this requires an abandonment of the reductive schema. All right, so we saw that there are three arguments that has been proposed um, for incompleteness of quantum theory, then physical field argument that the wave function cannot be uh, you have to add something to the wave function because the wave function is not in three dimensional space. No locality arguments um, that ultimately didn't work. Uh, uh, and the measurement problem that you, you, you do not observe macroscopic superposition. The one, then physical field problem is the strongest of all, right? Because it, it's the one that, uh, that requires you to add some three dimensional ontology. The non locality argument is weaker because it doesn't tell you how to complete 
it just uh, it just tells you that it has to be local. And the measurement problem is the weakest, right? Because it doesn't say how to complete it or whether to make it local. It just wants you to make the theory empirically adequate. But why should the realists be interested in such a problem? They should care about the, the, the three-dimensional ontology problem. Okay, so what do we do? What's the natural uh, choice? We try the fields. Um, the one of Schrodinger didn't work. The one of many words requires you to have infinite many words. So uh, do you have any other option? If you want to preserve the reductive schema, right? You, you, you don't even have, uh, um, if you just focus on the on physical field problem, you don't have the GRW theory. You have no reason to consider consciousness, right? Um, so um, the realist should have tried to keep the reductive scheme by solving the physical field problems. By focusing on the measurement problem, they ended up giving too much credit to ideas like spontaneous collapse or many words that would have never been considered, right? Remember the what if theory, we never mentioned them. We can keep the reductive schema in terms of the motion of microscopic to dimensional object composing macroscopic bodies. The locality problem asks us to complete the theory in a local way, but we cannot have that because of that, right? So this creates a true conflict with relativity. And this is what, this is the true quantum revolution. And this is what we should be thinking about. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.